So today we're going to start a series on the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. I will be going over all of these verses very carefully, and that will take a little bit of time. If we reach a holiday, I will preach something topical for that holiday. Otherwise, we will be in 1 Timothy for a little while. First, some background. This is the first of two letters that Paul wrote to his beloved son in the faith. Timothy received his name, which means one who honors God from his mother Eunice and grandmother Lois, devout Jews who became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ according to 2 Timothy 1.5. I'm going to give you guys plenty of scripture references here for those of you with pencils prepared to write. And they taught Timothy the Old Testament scriptures from his childhood, according to 2 Timothy 3.15. His father, Timothy, was a Greek, according to Acts 16.1, who may have died before Timothy met Paul. Timothy was from Lystra, according to Acts 16.1 through 3, which is a city in the Roman province of Galatia that is part of modern-day Turkey. Paul led Timothy to Christ, according to 1 Timothy 1, 2 and 1, 18, also 1 Corinthians 4, 17 and 2 Timothy 1, 2. Undoubtedly, this is during his ministry in Lystra on his first missionary journey that is covered in Acts chapter 14, verses 6 through 23. When he revisited Lystra on his second missionary journey, Paul chose Timothy to accompany him, according to Acts 16, 1 through 3. Although Timothy was very young, probably in his late teens or early 20s, since about 15 years later, Paul refers to him as a young man, in chapter 4, verse 12 of 1 Timothy. He had a reputation for godliness, according to Acts 16, 2. Timothy was to be Paul's disciple, friend, and co-laborer for the rest of the apostle's life, ministering with him in Berea, Acts 17, 14, in Athens, in Acts 17, 15, and in Corinth, Acts 18, 5, as well as 2 Corinthians 1, 19, and accompanying him on his trip to Jerusalem, according to Acts 24. He was with Paul in his first Roman imprisonment and went to Philippi, according to Philippians 2, 19 through 23, after Paul's release. In addition, Paul frequently mentions Timothy in his epistles, as well as Romans 16, 21, 2 Corinthians 1, 1, Philippians 1, 1, Colossians 1, 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, and Philemon chapter 1. Paul often sent Timothy to churches as his representative, as he did in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, and 16.10, and in Philippians 2.19, and 1 Thessalonians 3.2. And 1 Timothy finds him on another assignment, serving as pastor of the church at Ephesus, according to chapter 1, verse 3, and according to Hebrews 13.23, Timothy was imprisoned and later released. The authorship. Tradition strongly supports the fact that the Apostle Paul was the author of this epistle. The letter claims Paul as its author in chapter 1, verse 1, and it is filled with Pauline themes and even contains a brief autobiography, chapter 1, verses 11 through 15. While some critics tend to reject the Pauline authorship of the pastoral epistles, the letter's acceptance dates as far back as Polycarp, 
Clement of Rome, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and Clement of Alexandria. Paul wrote 1 Timothy from Macedonia in AD 62 or 63. He sent the letter to Timothy, whom he had left at Ephesus. He wrote to encourage Timothy in his responsibilities for overseeing the work of the Ephesian church and possibly the other churches of the province of Asia. It is possible that he wrote this epistle from Philippi after being released from his first imprisonment in Rome. Many modernist critics delight in attacking the plain statement of scripture and for no good reason they deny that Paul wrote the pastoral epistles. That's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Ignoring the testimony of the letters themselves, which can be found in 1 Timothy 1, 1, 2 Timothy 1, 1, and Titus 1, 1, and that of the early church, which is as strong for the pastoral epistles as for any of Paul's epistles, except, of course, for Romans and 1 Corinthians. These critics maintain that a devout follower of Paul wrote the pastoral epistles in the second century. Now, this kind of theology is taught in every major Bible college in the world. There is an online app that is called The Great Courses, where you can take college lectures at major colleges around the country. They have four Bible classes. All are about 16 to 40 hours long. Three of those classes start out with a professor explaining that we don't know who wrote any of the Bible and that it's all made up and they say it's from those myths that Christianity sprung and that the Bible is fiction. And the fourth show is a lecture series from an old Catholic priest who says, maybe, maybe it could have happened, but he highly doubts it. That is the problem with a whole lot of modern day Bible colleges. They start with the idea that the Bible isn't really the word of God, and then they go from there. I promise you, that I have seen Christian colleges that turn out as many atheists as they do preachers because they don't believe we have God's word. Anyway, in this letter, Paul exhorts Timothy to guard against false doctrine, protect public worship, and develop mature leadership. Most, most of the epistle deals with the nature of pastoral conduct, including the, comp, the qualifications of being a bishop or pastor as a true teacher of God's word. Timothy, Greek Timotheus, means honoring God or honored by God. The theological themes. 1 Timothy is a practical letter containing pastoral instruction from Paul to Timothy. We see that in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Since Timothy was well versed in Paul's theology, the, the apostle had no need to give him extensive doctrinal instruction. This epistle does, however, express many important theological truths, such as the proper function of the law, chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Salvation, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, and chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. The attributes of God, chapter 1, verse 17. The fall of man, chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And the person of Christ, chapter 3, verse 16, and chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. And the second coming of Christ, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. 1 Timothy lays the foundation for ordaining elders in the local church. It provides an apostolic guideline for ordaining men to the sacred office of the church. In essence, it is a leadership manual 
for church organization and administration. Its tone is practical and spiritual. Its theme is that of conduct in the church of the living God. Christ is presented in this epistle as the mediator between God and men, chapter 2, verse 5. And as such, he is the savior of all men who believe in him, chapter 4, verse 10. He is the Lord of the church to whom Timothy is responsible as an undershepherd. The term bishop, or the Greek episkopos, is used synonymously with the term elder, presbyterios, and refers to the same office according to Acts 20, 17, 28, and Titus chapter 1, verses 5 and 7. The office of deacon, diaconus, or servant, is a different office, but with sim similar qualifications. Now that we have a foundation built, for the next couple of months, we can actually get into the scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I love the grace, mercy, and peace greeting. We only get this from Paul three times. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Something to remember. Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. Mercy is God sparing us from what we do deserve. Verse 3. As I urged you when I was going into Macedonia, stay at Ephesus that you might command certain men not to teach a different doctrine and not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than God's stewardship which is in faith. But the goal of the command is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith from which from which things some, having missed the mark, have turned aside to vain talking, desiring to be teachers of the law, though they understand neither what they say nor about what they strongly affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. I want to point out here as I begin that the writings of Paul are found, recorded, and cataloged as the earliest Christian writings. That doesn't mean they are the oldest. It just means that we can prove how old they are. And we know that Paul's letter begins uh, 25 to 35 years after the death of Christ. 25 to 35 years after Christ returns from the dead, Paul is writing. Timothy is the grandson of a Christian and the son of of a Christian. He is without a doubt one of the first people in history to grow up in a Christian home. Think about that. How cool is it that 40 years after Christ, we have kids growing up in third generation Christian homes? I just thought that part was awesome. I also think it's awesome how in verse 2 Paul says, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Now, I would venture a guess that Paul was there for the prayer of confession when Timothy gave his life to Christ. I am sure Paul may have given the message or even had the authority to back up his message when he met with Timothy the first time. But I imagine a whole lot of Timothy's conversion is owed to the fact that that he had a Christian family. His mom is asking him, have you met Paul? Did you talk to Paul? Have you seen Paul? His grandmother is saying, why don't you pray with me? Why don't we get into the scriptures? His mom is telling him about Jesus at the dinner table. His grandma says, you should come to the Bible study. That's every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. or whatever time they did it back then. 
But in verse 2, we see Paul take responsibility for Timothy. And that's something else that we must strive to do. You see, in the early days of Christianity, if you led someone to Christ, you didn't just walk them through a prayer, tell them where to sit in the church building, and then ignore them. If you led someone to Christ, you were responsible for them. We talked about this in Bible study, that you can't take a newborn baby into the woods and drop them off and say, you're on your own now, kid. You have to hold on to them and teach them and protect them. Often, you have to protect them from themselves. We have to remember to be there for each other, whether the person is a new Christian or not. If you want your child to learn to throw and catch a baseball, you go out and get a couple of gloves and a ball and you teach them to throw and catch. You don't drop them off at the park and hope that somebody with two gloves and a ball shows up to teach them. Paul just as easily could have said, well, Timothy is right with God. He has a Christian family to help him along, so he will be just fine, and he could have never looked back. But he took responsibility for him as a son. And then Paul wanted from Timothy what we all want from our children. He wanted his spiritual son, his son in the faith, to go out and make him a grandpa and bring spiritual grandchildren to Christ. Every time I read Genesis 1, 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, I believe that is the same commandment that God gave his church. We need to be fruitful and multiply. So in this chapter, we see that Paul has asked Timothy to stay in Ephesus for the reason, verse 3, that you might command certain men not to teach a different doctrine and not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. Myths are stories that are not true. What Paul is saying is don't mix a story into your doctrine just because it's a good story. We have from this time period what are called pseudopigrapha writings or falsely titled writings. Somebody wants to get an idea out into the world, but they are unknown. So they write something up and they just sign Paul's name to it and wham, they have an instant hit. Back in the 1980s, horror writer, Stephen King started to wonder if people were buying his books because he was a good writer or if people were buying his books because they said Stephen King on the cover. He wrote several books under the name Richard Bachman just to see if he could sell books and no one know it was him writing them. He wrote several successful books until the book Thinner was a hit. They wanted to make thinner into a movie and they desperately needed to speak to Richard Bachman who didn't exist so Stephen King was exposed. Paul was warning not to let these myths become part of doctrine. Some of you guys may have seen this a while back when Carrie Fisher from Star Wars passed away. People were posting stuff online like there's a disturbance in the force today and the princess is with the angels. Listen, I love Star Wars and Star Trek, but that simple mingling of pop culture and religion is what Paul is warning against. You end up with kids that think Jesus carried a lightsaber and hung out with 12 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm giving you guys cartoon examples, of course, but you get the point. Some things we cannot compromise on. Quick side note, isn't it funny that during Paul's time, if you wrote a new book and you wanted it to be a hit, you had to put an old name on it and try and tie it into history 
and learning. Now you write a new book. If you want it to be a hit, it has to be the newest thing from the newest name, saying new things, mainly like how dumb all the old things are. It is so funny how smart old men got to be after I became one. The scripture also says to avoid endless genealogies. Throughout scripture, we get the genealogy of Adam through Christ. One thing this is talking about is when it says endless is an idea that had come along at this point where people would sit and write genealogies for the angels and they would go on forever. So you get a group who would do this and it became a form of angel worship. They would make half angels who were demigods like the Greeks had. In many of these myths like we talked about, God made the angels and then they made us and the world at his command while he was off fishing, I guess. And because these angels were the creators, we should worship them equally. You also had the, during this time period the endless genealogies that come from other faiths, like the Hindus and the Buddhists. They believe Bob did not really die. He was reborn as Dave. And then if Dave leads a good life, maybe he's reborn as Cheryl. If he leads a bad life, he comes back as a yak or a squirrel or something. But I think this also speaks to something that Paul had to address later in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 15. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. I thank God that I baptized none of you. Boy, that Paul was an ear tickler, wasn't he? But again, he's telling us to avoid trying to trace a line or a heritage or a genealogy or a membership in a certain church to righteousness. There are a whole lot of churches today that still try and draw a line between themselves and Peter or themselves and John. And those things cannot bring us salvation. Paul tells Timothy, these are the things that lead to disputes in the church. Verse 5. But the goal of this command is love, out of a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. The goal of the command, Paul says, the reason I'm telling you this is love. In other words, even though these false doctrines are being passed around by these false teachers who Paul talks about in Acts 20, 29, he says, I know, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. So even after Paul calls these people savage wolves, he prophesies this would happen, and then it does. He does not tell Timothy, I want you to tell them to stop preaching that filth because we hate them. We are telling them that they need to stop doing wrong things because we love them. We love people, and we want them to come to the truth. And he's saying this comes from a pure heart and love. And here's why, verse 6, from which some things, having missed the mark, have turned aside to vain talking. The King James says it better, from which some swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. I love the idea of jangling talk. Just a lot of senseless, useless noise. The world is full of that. People who have heard something on TV, maybe, 
or Uncle Bill in Sunday school told them a story about women having that extra rib. Or they got an email about better Christianity through Buddhism. Or they get talked into reading the entire Book of Mormon. They say, those, Mo those Mormon boys were so nice, they even cut my grass. People have turned aside to hear vain talk, especially if it is something hip, something new, something cool they've never heard before, and they miss the mark. And this verse tells you why. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, though they understand neither what they say nor about what they strongly affirm. And this is what it boils down to. They want to think of themselves as Bible scholars. The problem is they're not actually scholars. That's why we cannot compromise, but also why we must take that position from a position of love. It is not a bad thing to want to be a Bible scholar. It's not a bad thing to want to teach people about your faith. But first, be the Bible scholar and then teach people from Scripture, not from opinion. There's a saying that goes around a lot these days. It is, we will just have to agree to disagree. People say that a lot to make the lines blurry between good and evil. When it comes to the things of this world, God sets the rules and our opinions simply don't matter. That's why it's so important to know God's word and what it says for yourself. My sermons should not teach you about God's word. They should inspire you to want to know God's word for yourself. The Bible is one of God's wonderful gifts to mankind. It contains the very words of our creator breathed out on every page. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible tells the story of a fallen humanity and reveals the depths to which God was willing to go to save his people from their sins. As we read the Bible, we're not just gaining instruction on how to live lives that bring glory to God, but we're also being shown the very nature and character of God. If you want to know God better, then know his word. Read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it. Let the words of God fill your heart and consume your mind. I will conclude this week with three things that help us put today's scripture into practice. Number one, pray. It's just that simple, pray. One pastor encouraged his people to read the Bible praying. Father, hold my mind's attention. Wake my heart's affection. Speak for your glory and my holy joy. Being saturated in prayer not only strengthens communion with God, it helps you fight the temptations of sleep, busyness, or apathy as a reason to miss out on knowing God through the Bible. Number two, plan. Plan it out. Set time aside. Reading through the entire Bible is a large task for sure. That's one of the reasons why having a plan is important. There are many different Bible reading plans available. Along with a plan, identify for yourself a time and a place to pray and read. That will put you, put it on your calendar if need be. Put a reminder on your phone. That will put the pressure and the distraction of the world on hold and you can spend time in the word. And number three, and this one probably seems obvious, practice, practice. Put your plan into practice. The goal of reading the Bible is not about perfection because there will be days that you do not read, but you should read and you want to read 
but you're not able to read. There will be days that you do read, but you might as well not have because of distractions. But there will also be days when the Spirit of God illuminates your heart and illuminates your mind to the text, and you will be drawn to worship. And you will be transformed even more into the image of your creator as you begin to know God through his word. And folks, those are the days that we've got to fight for. Those are the days that we must fight for. Guys, I thank you for listening to me this morning.